Good morning to you. You're watching Fox and Friends first on this Monday morning. I'm Rob Schmidt. And I'm Jillian Mealy. Thanks so much for starting your day with us. Let's get right to our top story this morning. Steve Bannon doing a complete 180. Yeah, the former White House chief strategist and now apologizing to the first family for his controversial comments in this new tell-all book, Fire and Fury. Griff Jenkins is live in Washington with how the president is firing back over all the questions about his mental stability in the wake of this book. Hey, Griff. <laughs> hey, Rob and Jillian. You know, maybe Sloppy Steve is campaigning for a new nickname, Backtrack Bannon. I'll explain. But first, the president vigorously defending himself over the weekend against allegations from this book, questioning his fitness for office, firing back in a news conference at Camp David, then tweeting, I've had to put up with the fake news from the first day I announced that I would be running for president. Now I have to put up with a fake book written by a totally discredited author. Ronald Reagan had the same problem and handled it well, so will I. And now Steve Bannon walking back some of his derogatory comments in the book. Remember, he called Don Jr. treasonous and unpatriotic and Ivanka dumb as a brick. He's not disputing the quotes and isn't formally apologizing for them either, but issued a statement pledging support for the president and explaining its criticism of the Trump Tower meeting was aimed at Paul Manafort, not Don Jr. He writes, I regret that my delay in responding to the inaccurate reporting regarding Don Jr. has diverted attention from the president's historical accomplishments in the first year of his presidency. My support is also unwavering for the president in his agenda. Donald Trump Jr. is both a patriot and a good man. He has been relentless in his advocacy for his father and for the agenda that has helped turn our country around. Bannon did not address the slight to Ivanka. This, as many of the president's allies, rallied to his defense, calling all of this ridiculous. Let me be very clear. This is a book of fiction. Not only is it not accurate, uh, there are so many misrepresentations in this book that it shouldn't be taken seriously. Statements like the one Mr. Wolf made about uh, how, how we all think about the president, just, they're just ridiculous on their face. The president travels to Nashville today to make remarks there and then to Atlanta finally tonight. Guys, where he'll take in the National College Football Championship. We'll see if he has any more to say about this. I'm sure he does, Griff. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You know, look, we've been hearing for a long time now, a lot of people on mm -hmm. other media outlets have been talking about President Trump's mental fitness, his stability. Sure. Yeah. And uh, here's just a, a little montage of some of the sound that we heard uh, from over the weekend. Here you go. He not only amplifies the coverage of this, but he also amplifies the questions that the book raises. We could look back a year from now and say the warning signs were there and we did not do enough. When you hear him put out that tweet, stable genius, it's kind of like Richard Nixon, I'm not a crook. It raises serious questions about his, his, his mental capacity, his ability to process mm -hmm. information, his impulse control. If we do have a president who has some fitness issues, even though he says he's like really smart, there are some problems that are happening. He has put this question of his competency by responding to it in the in the theatrical way he has in the middle of the conversation. If this book is to be believed, and I think it is credible, then it is actually quite frightening for the American people. He is like a child. I think we've probably all written this 500 times. Yeah, the conversation has certainly been ramped up, though, since this book, uh, the conversation about this book started last week. Sure, and one of those guys, actually, I think the CBS guy, made a decent point there when he said that, you know, by responding to this, um, he, he, the president almost gives it some kind of credibility by taking it seriously and being defensive about it, which right. I think has, has, has certainly been a problem. And the other problem is, is that this author, even though I, I'm sure this is a very dramatized book, he did have access mm -hmm. to the White House. And so people are going to take this as something that has going to have some truths peppered into it. And there he is right there, Michael Wolf. Uh, and, and these are the two big problems of the administration. And, and, and why the president decided to respond to this when he could have just ignored it is what we're trying to figure out. And a lot of the information that is in the book has already been shot down. So yeah. I, I don't know if you've seen the book yet. I haven't seen it in person to be able to read it. But I yeah. do want to read it and see what everyone is talking that, that's about. That's the other problem is everybody wants to read it everybody now. Because the president is now has responded to it, has given it this credibility by, by right. saying that, you know, you know, there's something to it. So, all right, let's listen to Tammy Bruce now and what she says about all of this. 
it's ironic. They're speaking of the president's mental health, uh, allegedly, mm -hmm. and it's based in their own hysteria. Our republic is based on the ability to have a dialogue, to have debate, uh, to have even fights and all of that. I mean, it's politics is the fight for power. Mm -hmm. This kind of accusation is meant to stop the conversation. It is like calling someone a racist or a sexist or a homophobe, but now it goes down to the personal condemnation about someone's mental fitness. Now, they also think that there could be a good uh, avenue for this, to use this when it comes to something like impeachment. But like everything the Democrats have done over the last generation, uh, it's it's a bad idea mm -hmm. and it will fail. Mm -hmm. And the American people, I don't think, like it very much right, and in it general. Seems that well, right, and the American people, I think, like the fact that the stock market is doing so well, that yeah. jobs are being created, and we're not talking about the economy as much as yeah. we should be. Yeah, he doesn't get a lot of credit for the things that he does. He gets slammed for some of the things like this. So yeah. we shall see where this all leads to. Yes, and, uh, we shall. We'll just follow the news. So Hollywood's biggest stars came together for the 75th annual Golden Globes last night in solidarity against sexual harassment. Yeah, some also using the platform to take shots at the White House, as you might expect, Carly Shimkus with Fox News Headlines 24-7 is here with the moments that everybody is talking about from last night. Hey, Carly. Hey, good morning, guys. Well, it was one of the biggest news stories of 2017, and host Seth Meyers wasted no time bringing up sexual harassment and sexual misconduct controversies rocking Hollywood. Take a listen. It's 2018, marijuana is finally allowed, and sexual harassment finally isn't. <laughs> The NBC late night comedian letting loose in his opening monologue with a string of jokes about the scandal, specifically calling out Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey. Harvey Weinstein isn't here tonight because, well, I've heard rumors that he's crazy and difficult to work with. But don't worry, he'll be back in 20 years when he becomes the first person ever booed during the in memoriam. Well, I was happy to hear they're going to do another season of House of Cards. Is Christopher Plummer available for that, too? I hope he can do a southern accent, because Kevin Spacey sure couldn't. Well, celebrities also joining the conversation without words. On the heels of the Me Too movement, many dressed in black meant to declare time's up on a culture of silence. Oprah Winfrey won the Cecil B. DeMille Lifetime Achievement Award using her speech about women fighting to be heard. At this moment, there are some little girls watching as I become the first black woman to be given the same award. I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. Well, Winfrey's fans praising the speech, calling for her to run for president. NBC even joining the 2020 push on Twitter, tweeting, nothing but respect for our future president. Now, as for what the show was really about, the awards, of course, the big winners of the night, HBO's Big Little Lies for TV limited series, Nicole Kidman also winning Best Actress for her role on the show, a Best Actress in a TV series going to Elizabeth Moss for The Handmaid's Tale, and Sterling K. Brown winning Best Actor in a TV series for his role on This Is Us. The big screens, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, winning multiple honors, including best motion picture for a drama. Unfortunately, the greatest show of all time, though, in my opinion, Game of Thrones walked away empty-handed. What? Wow. So sad. <clears throat> How is that possible? I think it was I've only up for one but... award, though, so <laughs> yeah. they gave it to The Handmaid's Tale. All right. Was well, Seth Meyers funny? You know what? I personally thought that his opening monologue was pretty funny. Not as political as I thought it yeah. would be either. I never so, thought he was that go. funny. I never, I never understood <laughs> how he got that job or why he gets these gigs, but, you know, I, I guess. Yeah, no, yeah, he got, he did, watch he it back. I, I laughed out loud at least once. Oh, okay. okay. So <laughs> it wasn't terrible. All right. That says something, Carly. Thanks not so a much. stunning Carly. review, but <laughs> not terrible. I laughed once. It was great. Yeah, there you go. All right. Carly. Ten minutes after the hour, while Democrats slam President Trump's immigration policy, Dozens of them voted for more border security just a few years ago, and this story goes back further than that. It is wrong and ultimately self-defeating for a nation of immigrants to permit the kind of abuse of our immigration laws we have seen in recent years. Illegal immigration, it used to be a bipartisan issue. So why are Democrats suddenly so against protecting our borders. Our next guest is a legal immigrant who says it all proves that the Dems are only playing politics. Plus Disney under fire for... 
Good morning and welcome back. Democrats responding to President Trump's hard line on immigration by refusing to back the border wall. But the left was on board when it was President Bill Clinton's idea. That's why our administration has moved aggressively to secure our borders more, by hiring a record number of new border guards, by deporting twice as many criminal aliens as ever before. It is wrong and ultimately self-defeating for a nation of immigrants to permit the kind of abuse of our immigration laws we have seen in recent years, and we must do more to stop it. And even in 2013, the Democrats were on board with border security. So what has changed now? Joining us to discuss is the author of Green Card Warrior, Retaking America, Nick Adams. Nick, thank you for joining us this morning. I appreciate your time. Uh, you're, you came here to this country legally. Can you, before we get started on this, just share a little bit of your story? Jillian, it's great to be with you. Look, uh, I wanted to become an American for as long as I can remember. I wanted to do it the right way. And when you try and come to America the right way, it's very difficult. It costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. And for four and a half years, I very patiently waited in line. I did everything right. I dotted my I's. I crossed my T's. And finally, I came to the United States of America. So as somebody that did things the right way, it's extraordinarily frustrating for me to see uh, people doing it the wrong way rewarded. So do you agree then with President Trump's views on tightening border security and why we need it? Without a doubt, Gillian, look, it's really important that we enforce the laws that we have on the books. It's really important that our borders are secure because if we don't have borders, if we don't enforce our laws, we don't have a country. And I completely agree with the president on this. There's nothing anti-immigrant. There's nothing hard line about his stance. Uh, we know that the Democrats back in the 1990s were on the same page. And even more recently in 2013, uh, this is really about the president more so than the immigrant policy, they're prepared to absolutely attack and reject anything that he proposes. Well, right, and you mentioned 2013. In that year, there were 39 current Senate Democrats who voted yes to border security. I mean, that's a lot of them. And, and I'm not sure if it's a confusion in the Democratic Party as to them not knowing exactly what they want, because if you look at all those faces on the screen, you look at what they voted for back then, it was double length of a new border fence with Mexico to end the diversity visa lottery program to spend $40 billion on border security in addition to many other things. So is it that they don't want border security or they just don't want the wall because President Trump wants the wall? Look, there are a lot of different factors, Gillian. It's fair to say that the cultural winds have changed, that the Democratic Party has changed. Uh, you know, things are going more and more leftward. We see that. Uh, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that President Trump is the president. They don't like him. They're prepared to diminish him as much as they possibly can. Uh, and, uh, and we see this. I mean, you know, in, in 2006, President Obama was on C-SPAN talking about the importance of securing borders and, and proposing the very things that the president's proposing now. So this is really a conglomerate of things, but at the end of the day, I think that this is all about undermining President Trump because he's the left's worst nightmare. Nick Adams, thank you for sharing your story and thank you for joining us this morning. Pleasure, Jillian. Rob. All right, good stuff. 18 minutes after the hour, did CNN try to silence a senior White House advisor? You're being obsequious. No, you're being which, a factotum no, in order you're to being, please him, okay? No. And I think, you know, I've you know I, I think I've wasted enough of my you viewers' know who time. I, you know who Thank I you, care Stephen. about? This was a fun little exchange we saw yesterday. More from that and how the president is reacting this morning. And after months of scandals, Hollywood gets together to try and save face at the Golden Globes. It's 2018. Marijuana is finally allowed and sexual harassment finally isn't. It's going to be a good year. Our next guest says that uh, last night's show was more like a funeral. Comedian Chad Prather joins us live coming up next. I want to thank everyone who broke their silence this year and spoke up about abuse and harassment. You are so brave. Time is up. We see you. We hear you. And we will tell your stories. The Hollywood elite coming together to call out some of their own sexual harassment headlining last night's Golden Globes.
But even with the elephant in the room, celebrities couldn't hold back on the attacks against the Trump administration as we expected. So what did viewers think of this politically charged award show? Here to react is comedian Chad Prather. Chad, what did you think? Oh, you remember when award shows were about the winners? Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's not about that anymore. I think at this point, this politicizing of award shows in Hollywood, it's about as effective as Barack Obama giving a keynote speech at the NRA convention. Uh, it's like the band playing while the Titanic goes down. It's a circular firing squad. It, it, it's pretty fitting they wore, I mean, it, this, this, they wore black to this thing. It's almost like they're going to their own wake. It, it's, it's really a crazy, crazy deal out there. In fact, I think people should be, in Hollywood, they need to be thankful for these uh, you know, low unemployment numbers so guys like uh, Seth Meyers can still get work. Look, I mean, <laughs> celebrities, <laughs> actors and actresses, they have a platform, right? I, as a woman, am happy to see people finally speaking out against things like sexual yeah. harassment. But, but seeing that, you know, sea of black gowns last night, it made me wonder, why didn't you do this a long time ago? Why, why wait until now? Well, it, you're exactly right. You know, the... Uh, to, to be a little bit uh, mean here, the, the old Greek word, the ancient Greek word, hypocrites, meant actor. And how many women were sitting there with black dresses on last night that have, for the last 20 and 30 years, have turned a blind eye to the sexual abuse that was going on against colleagues and, and people in the industry, people like Meryl Streep, who stood up and applauded Roman Polanski, who called Harvey Weinstein a god. I think the hypocrisy has oozed out into their false reality in such a way that uh, it, it's, it's sort of it's getting, a little bit, uh, getting a little bit crazy in Hollywood. It's a little bit too late. I mean, did you did you think it was a good show? I guess is my question. I mean, unfortunately, we had to go to bed last I night, know. so I, I, I was uh, I was curious to see how this would all go down. But I mean, I understand that it was certainly a very charged atmosphere. Did they pull it off? And I, yes, and to be clear, I am all for empowerment for women, and certainly I hope that their decision in Hollywood goes beyond a career. Uh, or sorry. Uh, uh, a wardrobe choice and a hashtag. I too had to get up at 2.30 this morning to come in. So I was doing something more productive than watching the Golden Globes like, you know, chewing glass. Uh, I'm, I'm just over it at this point, I really am. I, Hollywood has long ago forfeited the right to take the moral high ground and preach to the rest of America about what's right and wrong. They sh they've done a little too, they've done too little too late at this point, in my opinion. Curious to see what the ratings are. Yeah, me come out. too. I'm very, very much so. Chad, thank you so much for coming on this morning. We appreciate your time. Thanks. All right. 25 minutes after the hour, President Trump blasting what he calls out of control media bias. And there has been no collusion between us and the Russians. Now, there has been collusion between Hillary Clinton, the DNC and the Russians. Unfortunately, you people don't cover that very much. But well, is the media trying to distract from the president's actual victories? You want to hear what our next guest has to say. President Trump heading to farm country today to rally support for his agenda. His brand new push to put rural America back on the map in a live report. That's next. We are back now with a Vox News alert. A sheriff's deputy in Washington state killed while responding to a suspected home invasion. That's right. The Pierce County Sheriff's Office says this deputy was shot by a man during a foot chase in Spanaway, which is about 40 miles due south of Seattle, right near the McCord Air Force Base. The suspect that shot the officer is still on the loose as it's about 2.30 in the morning uh, there in the Seattle area. Another suspect was found dead at the scene. Uh, no word yet on how he was killed. We're going to continue to follow this story. We'll get you more developments as they come in. In the meantime, President Trump heading to Nashville today to rally supporters as immigration reform takes center stage at budget talks this week. Yeah, Todd Pyro is here uh, with uh, where negotiations stand at this point. Hey, Todd. Hey, Rob. Hey, Jillian. Good morning to both of you. In just a few hours, the president will be speaking at the American Farm Bureau Convention, the first time a sitting president has addressed this group in 25 years to tout rural and agricultural 
overall community success. All this while a host of other issues top his agenda. Number one on that list for now, DACA. With a potential government shutdown less than two weeks away, congressional leaders and the White House will try and resolve their differences over the status of young immigrants, which has become a main obstacle to government spending deal. President Trump has stressed that any plan on DREAMers won't happen without a wall, and while Democrats reject that, they appear split over whether to force a government shutdown to get their way. We want the wall. The wall's going to happen or we're not going to have DACA. Uh, we want to get rid of chain migration. Very important. And we want to get rid of the lottery system. In addition to that, we want some money for funding. We need some additional border security. We all want DACA to happen, but we also want great security for our country. Government shutdown would be a disaster for this country. So what we have got to do, it seems to me, is to pass the DREAMers legislation, which protects and provides legal status to these young people. Later on, we have to work for comprehensive immigration reform. That's what the American people want. The American people, in fact, do not want to spend billions of dollars on a wall. The Trump administration has proposed spending $18 billion over 10 years to extend the border wall with Mexico, calling for 316 miles of additional barriers by the year 2027. Jillian. All right, Todd. President Trump open to talks with North Korea, but keeping a firm stance against threats. The president demanding Kim Jong-un meet his conditions of denuclearization. But Asia analyst Gordon Chang says that won't happen anytime soon. I don't think that the North Koreans are there yet. The president has a strong program of cutting off the flow of money to North Korea so that North Korea is in a position where it realizes it has no choice but to disarm. We can get there, um, and we can get there without the use of force, but it's going to take a little while longer. All this as the U.S. military sends a new warship to the Pacific. The USS Wasp is capable of deploying fighter jets that North Korea's radars cannot detect. Steve Bannon doing a complete 180. The former White House chief strategist now apologizing to the first family for his comments in the tell-all book Fire and Fury, where he called Donald Trump Jr.'s meeting with a Russian lawyer treasonous. Bannon telling Fox News, quote, Donald Trump Jr. is both a patriot and a good man. He has been relentless in his advocacy for his father and the agenda that has helped turn our country around. And my support is also unwavering for the president and his agenda. Bannon claims his comments were aimed at Paul Manafort, who is facing conspiracy against the United States charges unrelated to the campaign. White House senior policy advisor Stephen Miller also defending the president against comments made in Fire and Fury. He got into a very heated exchange with Jake Tapper, the CNN host, eventually cutting him off. A self-made billionaire who revolutionized reality TV and, and who has sure changed the course of our politics. He's watching and he's happy that you said that. But you know, Jake, my you can question, be no, no, you can my, be condescending. I'm and, not being no, condescending. I'm no, trying to get to the point be, that Steve Bannon. You can be condescending. That was a snide remark, Stephen. Material. You're, being, you're not going to give three minutes for the American people I to get hear it. the real experience you, you, of you, Donald Trump. There's one viewer that you care about right now, and you're being obsequious. No, you're being a fact no, totem in order to please him. Okay. And I think I've wasted. I think I've wasted enough of my viewers' time. You know who I care about. There are reports after that exchange. Miller was escorted off the set by CNN security. And it turns out the president was watching, tweeting, quote, Jake Tapper of fake news CNN just got destroyed in his interview with Stephen Miller of the Trump administration. Watch the hatred and unfairness of this CNN flunky. Well, Brian Ross heading back to ABC today, but with a different job following this botched report about President Trump and Michael Flynn. He's prepared to testify that President Trump, as a candidate, Donald Trump, ordered him, directed him to make contact with the Russians, which contradicts all that Donald Trump has said at this point. Ross is starting a new gig with ABC's outside production house, Lincoln Square Productions. It is believed he will hold the same title as a chief investigative correspondent, but will be focusing on long-term projects. He was suspended for four weeks without pay. Rob. All right, Jillian, thanks so much. President Trump calling out the media for harping on the Russian collusion story without covering the active investigations into Hillary Clinton and her foundation. There has been no collusion between us and the Russians. Now, there has been collusion between Hillary Clinton, the DNC, and the Russians. Unfortunately, you people don't cover that very much. But 
So is this, uh, the harping on the Russia collusion, is this a tactic to distract from the president's accomplishments? That's the question this morning, and here to debate that is the spokesperson for America First Policies, Katrina Pearson, and the CEO of All In Together, Lauren Leader Chevet. Ladies, thanks so much for coming morning. on this morning. morning. Uh, Lauren, we want to start with you. Uh, it, it does seem to appear that there is less of an interest uh, in the Hillary Clinton investigation than there is into the Russia investigation. Would you agree with that? Well, yeah, because there's nothing there and it's been investigated for years and found to be baseless. It, I mean, I will say it was on the cover of the New York Times when the new inve supposed investigation started up in the last week. And so it's certainly not been ignored, but the reality is, is that this was uh, investigated extensively last year and found to be uh, baseless. And obviously at a time where you've got the inner circle of the sitting president of the United States, uh, mm -hmm. indicted on multiple different counts, including his national security advisor, his campaign chief, et cetera. I mean, obviously that's gonna generate substantially more interest because it affects the sitting president. Right. And I think there's a lot of questions about whether or not the president has given pressure to the Department of Justice, and frankly, from coverage on this network, uh, to pressure political folks at the DOJ but, to but go But can, I, can, I, can I cut in real quick? I mean, it, it, now that we're seeing some of the issues we've seen within the FBI and within the Department of Justice, you're seeing the some biases in these departments and now they reopen these investigations just because these investigations haven't gone anywhere in the past maybe doesn't necessarily mean that you know it's an all clear well, at some point well at some point when you have to ask the question when is it worth taxpayer dollar and expense to continue to prosecute something that has already been explored and found to be baseless and okay. I think the question that a lot of people are asking is whether or not this new investigation is actually politically driven and there's you know the president had promised all throughout the campaign that he would go after Hillary Clinton and if he was elected and that they should lock her up regardless of whether or not there was any basis for that. So for a lot of folks, it's extremely concerning that then suddenly the DO, you know, both the FBI and the DOJ are getting politicized. Listen, I think it's bad on both sides. It's not good for the country. Sure. The, ju the judiciary is meant to be independent. That is the hallmark of our, dem of our democracy. And that should be true regardless of who's sitting in the White House. Yeah, let me go over to Katrina real quick. I mean, you have, you know, Hillary Clinton is obviously not the president, so she's not going to be scrutinized as heavily as the president of the United States. And I agree with that. But you also have a situation where you, you had a candidate that was acid washing emails and destroying laptops and phones, the fact that there was never any charges there, I think blew a lot of minds. Because there was Katrina well, not only did it not only did it blow minds. I mean, to answer your question, yes, this is absolutely a distraction from the president's accomplishments because a there is no Russia collusion. Everyone knows this now, which is why the media is consistently pointing at fake news like Brian Ross at CNN or like Brian Ross at ABC and CNN focusing on fake WikiLeaks reporting. But I will say that the reason why this investigation has come back up is because it wasn't thoroughly investigated. What we have found from the Russia collusion investigation is that the original Hillary Clinton email investigation was compromised by agents who were actually working for her during the presidential campaign. You have an individual like Peter Sturzok who had to be removed from the Mueller investigation simply because of the text messages that were found. Then come to find out he was also one of the lead investigators on the Hillary Clinton email and the language was changed to avoid criminal statutes. So yes, this investigation should be open. The question is, are we going to spend the exact same resources and make those available to the Hillary Clinton email investigation? Because as you said, there are still 30,000 missing emails, Blackberries that were destroyed let let, with hammers and servers have been wiped. And let, the, me, let me let Lauren respond to that, the, go ahead. The perpetual attacks on our civil servants, both in the FBI and in the Department of Justice undermines the fundamental premise of our democracy, which is an independent judiciary. It is an attempt, which is political in nature, to undermine their credibility in advance of potentially damaging information against the president. It's extremely disturbing. And for those, for anyone who believes in the in the core principles of our democracy, it's just outrageous and inappropriate to be going after and making personal attacks on what should be an independent judiciary. The okay. only thing that right. undermines the civil servants is when they are using uh, information like the Trump dossier that was completely unverified, potentially taxpayer funded by the FBI to obtain false. illegal warrants that's to false. monitor political opposition okay. to criminally go after them. Ladies, that's I, what I, undermines I, democracy. We've, we've, we've seen charges on the side of the Trump administration. We have questions about why you would destroy laptops and phones if you had nothing to hide. There's good points on both sides. Ladies, thanks so much for coming on this morning. We will continue to debate Thank this you. in the future.
All right, let's go over to Janice now, who has uh, the best news of the day, which is that it's actually warmer on the East Coast, thank God. Thank goodness, let's take a look at it. I mean, 19 feels downright balmy to what we've been experiencing uh, here in New York City over the last several days. Look at the temperature difference from this time yesterday, 24 hours, 30 d degree difference in Cleveland. So you get the point, warmer air is on the way, and uh, man, it is going to be exciting here in New York City. But we have to get through this next little storm system because We've got one on the move across the Ohio Valley that could bring a wintry mix towards the mid-Atlantic and the Northeast later on today. Not a lot of moisture associated with it, so we're not talking about a big winter storm, but we have winter weather advisories from the Ohio Valley in towards the Northeast. So there's our storm system. It kind of loses its oomph as it goes through the uh, overnight tonight, and then things will start to warm up. Also want to make mention quickly is we have a pattern change, heavy rain moving into Southern California, which would, you would think would be a good news story. However, flooding is going to be a concern, especially across the burn areas. Back to you. Okay. Take Absolutely. the 30s. Yes. Sounds very the 30s warm are going to be lovely. balmy. <laughs> Thanks, Janice. You got it. It is 41 minutes after the hour. Oprah, you will never be president. Now we just wait and see. But could Oprah be making a run for the White House in 2020? The brand new buzz from the Golden Globes. And. Not dark enough. Disney under fire for browning actors. The bombshell admission that is sparking outrage this morning. We will explain what we're talking about. And the lawsuit over lattes. Starbucks accused of cheating you out of coffee? What? The grand ruling just in.